fish can be found almost in every place where there's water. You can find them in cold water mountain creeks to hot stationary rain puddles. They have evolved for millions of years in a vast array of forms, shapes and colors. Breeding and feeding habits have specialized and diversified to fill every available aquatic niche. Here you will get to see what their natural habitat really looks like. There are innumerable types of continental or freshwater aquatic habitats in Venezuela, but I generalize them this way. Brackish water, lakes and dams, silty rivers, mountain rivers, Tannic rivers, flooded areas, and Morichales. In the wild, from humans to plants, they all depend on our natural aquarium in many ways. Non-aquatic organisms depend on our natural aquariums for food. As the birds that feed on fish and crustaceans. They also rely on our natural aquariums as a drinking water source or simply to take a bath. biotopes you can find a large amount of aquatic fauna like the amphibians which depend on the humidity and water to reproduce. Other important inhabitants of our natural aquariums are the reptiles. They occupy the top of the food chain of all these aquatic systems. Some of these reptiles are extremely dangerous, like this Micrurus naturarii, which is the most poisonous aquatic snake in Venezuela.
This is probably the first underwater footage of this species in its natural habitat. It can last more than five minutes underwater without coming up for air. It is commonly called the aquatic coral snake and this specimen was over four feet long. All these reptiles feed on the slowest organisms, which are normally the sick ones. Maintaining this way, a sickness control in all the aquatic biotopes. Most biotopes with silty or extremely tannic water contain floating aquatic plants. Their waters are too turbid to let any sunlight penetrate it. Without sunlight, the subaquatic plants cannot make their natural process of photosynthesis. Many species of fish fixate their eggs to the hanging roots of all these floating plants. In clear water biotopes is where you can observe the subaquatic plants in their maximum splendor. The aquatic and subaquatic plants are important in all healthy aquatic systems. A great number of crustaceans live and reproduce on them, like the freshwater shrimps. These shrimps and crustaceans, big or newly born, are a key food source for almost all the fish in our natural aquariums. The leaves of the subaquatic plants act like tentacles that trap the organic matter that is dragged by the water current. This organic matter is then consumed by the fish. The leaves of the subaquatic plants are also used by the fish to place their eggs. Once the fry are born, they use the large amount of vegetation as a hideout, avoiding this way to be eaten by the bigger fish. The amount of fish that an aquatic habitat can house depends largely on the quantity of aquatic and subaquatic plants that it contains. If there are more plants, there will be more places to place their eggs, more hideouts, and more crustaceans to feed on. In the same way as all these organisms depend on our natural aquariums, our natural aquariums depend on the seasons. There are only two seasons in Venezuela the rainy season and the dry season. We're here in the natural habitat of Corridoras Septentrionales, um, Corridoras Aeneus. You got millions of Atacinclus, Athenis, 
and you got a lot of oplius. There's a lot of turtles and some crocodiles. There's Apistogramma hognei, and there's a lot of uh, hatchet fish, the Toracocherax stellatus. All these little pools, which here are called pozos, are what is left over of all the flooded waters from the rain. When the rains hit this area, all the land around it floods. Once the dry season starts, all the waters the water level goes down and only these little pozos or pools are left behind. All the fish are stuck here. The ones that weren't intelligent enough or the ones that didn't have the instinct to go down the river to the main river are caught in these pools. There's millions of fish here and normally the ones that are left behind are the ones that are that have a high tolerance to low oxygen waters. These waters are very low of oxygen because there's literally millions of little fish here. Um, you can see how they go up and down the quarries and the auto sinkless that get air probably from the outside, helps them in their digestion. And the hoplius malabaricus or the wolf fish are the are very high tolerant in oxygen. So the they are left behind too here. In a month or so, these waters are going to turn completely green from the feces of all the, of all the turtles and the reptiles that are here. And it's practically fluorescent green in a month. And in about two months, this place is going to dry out. All the fish in here are going to die. And then the, the birds come in and they eat all the little fish that are left behind and the big fish like big plecos, um, big sucker fish or big hoplius that cannot be eaten by the birds are going to be eaten by either the crocodiles or some scavengers. We have small wolf foxes here, small wolves. They're, um, or uh, if they die, and they're going to be eaten by the vultures. So we'll try to come here in a month and try to film it when it's really green and the sad part is that all of them die all the fish here die and it's part of the ecology here it's part of nature and that's how it works in this area of the Cojeda state in Venezuela from the moment that a raindrop starts its voyage from the clouds down to earth, it begins a very complex process. As the raindrops fall, they capture innumerable molecules and particles that are suspended in the air as oxygen, pollen, and dust. As they fall through the trees or hit the ground, they bring life to all the flora and fauna. Once on the ground, the rainwater erodes the earth and picks up minerals which alter its chemical parameters. At this moment, it also starts passing by rotting or decomposing organic matter, such as leaves, fruits, falling tree trunks, and branches. All of this decomposing organic material transfer tannins to the water, making it tea-colored and acidic. As the millions of drops get together and saturate the ground, the excess of water starts to flow, creating small miniature creeks, which bring all these new natural chemicals into the rivers, creating our natural aquariums.
Rain does much more than fill up the rivers and aquatic habitats with water. It modifies the landscape by eroding it. It also brings a different temperature than the existing water in the river. All these water parameter changes activate the fish, reproductive and migrating instincts. It also does what we call in the aquarium hobby a water change, diluting and getting rid of dangerous chemicals such as ammonia, nitrite and nitrate. The water parameters of any rivers are greatly influenced by its surrounding land substrate and vegetation. These plants withstand the harshest of the environments. They live right here on these black rocks, which are around 60 degrees Celsius. And they're bone dry in the dry season and for months you see how they have been burnt down by fire and they just withstand these extreme temperatures and these, this harsh environment and they look, they look like prehistoric plants. In the dry season most of these plants burn down and they withstand around six months of drought. After that, when the rainy season comes, they're, they get a good rain for at least four months. They get good rain for four months and they're absolutely amazing. If the surrounding land consists of dirt or soil, which is 80% of the time, you get silty rivers. If there is an excess of rotting vegetation or organic matter, near a river, which is probably 19.5% of the time, you get extremely tea-colored tannic waters. Both of these types of waters are impossible to photograph or film in, so our natural aquarium underwater voyage will be confined to the remaining 0.5%. The equation is simple, the remaining 0.5% of the rivers have clear waters, and as the statistics show, they are very hard to find. Finding waters which are clear enough to photograph or video in them is not easy. It requires endless hours of driving. got the car on the barge and this barge takes us across the Orinoco River which is the biggest river in Venezuela. The ride is around 10-15 minutes long to the other side and once on the other side we're officially in the Amazon state of Venezuela.
some expeditions we have to travel in the back of a flatbed truck. Even though traveling this way is not comfortable at all, it gives you a chance to see how the vegetation changes as you leave the river and go into the jungle. It also gives you a good point of view of how some little Amazonian towns look like. Sometimes there is some off-roading involved. And when the road ends, you sometimes have to make one of your own. cars can't go any further, you get on a boat. Walking is also the only option in many occasions. All this driving, off-roading, traveling in a flatbed, or on a boat, or walking, brings you to some extraordinary places with small waterfalls, medium-sized waterfalls, or some that are probably more than 80 meters high. Right here we're filming some sort of catfish. The noise you can hear at the back is a waterfall. In the same way as we travel through the roads, the rivers are the roads where the fish travel. When the rains come to our natural aquariums, the breeding season is in. the main river on the east so all the fish are trying to swim up through the current and go up to the flooded area to lay their eggs and reproduce so they have to pass through this small stretch that's why there's so many fish here once the fish get to the reproductive areas they start courtship cichlids are a good example of how all this process takes place. It generally starts by females and males intensifying their coloration to attract the other gender, as you can see in this Leita car. Another distinctive behavior are the constant fights that occur between the males. I have seen these fights last more than five minutes. These fights can be made over territory, a female, or to get a higher hierarchy. Once the fish pair off and mate, the offspring is generally taken care of by both parents, as in the Leitacara, Mesonauta, or the cranny sichla. The female discrosses 
prefers to take care of her fry by herself. She guards her fry from any predator by scaring away any fish that comes six feet from her young, even if the fish are much bigger than her. When she feels that her fry are not safe, she moves them to another area. She carries them in her mouth to a new location and makes sure that none are left behind. At the same time, she still has to defend the area from any possible danger. The female Epistogramma prefer to take care of their fry by themselves too, but the males are always nearby to help guard the area. This same behavior can be seen in different species of the same genera, even if they live a thousand miles away from each other, as with the Epistogramma butata. Some cichlids take care of their fry until they are quite large, as the Crenicicla geai. In our natural aquariums, depending on the species, two fish can have from 20 to thousands of offspring. And as always things have to even out in nature, someone has to take advantage of all this new biomass. Normally, when you hear about the food chain, you hear how one animal eats another. In the aquarium hobby, you hear how the big fish eats the smaller one. I'm going to explain things in a different way. I'm going to show you the fish that in our natural aquariums normally don't get eaten by any other fish. We just found in this small creek an electrical eel. We're swimming right here with it and it's pretty dangerous. It discharges large amounts of electricity. So we're gonna try to come and swim with it and I'm just trying to be very cautious because I don't want to be electrocuted. Here you can see how the fish set aside as the Electrophorus electricus swims by and then they swim back when they are out of its reach. Large individuals of Electrophorus electricus can give off up to 650 volts, making them one of the most unedible fish in our natural aquariums. Right here in this river, we just found rays. Um, this, this freshwater stingrays are very, very dangerous if you step on them. They have some poison in their sting and they normally sting you in the foot if you step on them. They're really, really dangerous and painful. Okay, so let's go down there and swim with them.
One of the curious things that I have seen in our natural aquariums is that if a river has rummy nose tetras and rays, the rummy nose tetras are always found swimming around them. Here's a good example of how rays camouflage themselves in the river substrate. Their body colors and patterns have evolved to perfectly resemble their natural habitat. This part of the river was approximately 15 feet deep. Rays not only try to camouflage themselves in the sand, they also camouflage themselves in the vegetation. This large ray got very angry when I tried to get a second close-up of its eye and it struck the camera. Another species of ray which inhabits our natural aquariums is the Potamotrigon motoro. The other untouchables are the piranhas of the Picocentris Pristobrigan Saracalmus genera. All these untouchables have almost no natural predators, but they are the minorities in our natural aquariums. They are outnumbered by the touchables. Even though tropical aquarium fish are kept by millions of hobbyists worldwide, little is known of what their natural habitat really looks like. Here are a couple of my personal favorites.
As we go to more remote areas, we find fish that are extremely rare in the aquarium hobby, as the green Amocryptocharax elegans. What makes this little creek so special is that it has partial clear waters. The waters are not extraordinarily clear, but I hope they're good enough to film the Corydoras Aeneus underwater. And its waters are pretty cold, it's around 24 degrees Celsius. In some expeditions, we also find rare aquatic plants with unusual coloration. To video my favorite fish in our natural aquariums, Oliver Lucanus and I had to film by night in extremely tannic waters. This fish has partially disappeared from all the clear water streams by uncontrolled collecting and river water poisoning done by the natives to fish. And here it is.
I'm here in this creek, and I just can't believe that we have found Moinghausia pitieri. And the water is crystal clear, around 24 degrees Celsius, and it's the only place where you can find diamond tetras, or Moinghausia pitieri, in their natural habitat. This fish is partly extinct in all the rivers where it is autochthonous from. All, it is autochthonous from the Lake of Valencia, and all the rivers have around this area have been contaminated or polluted, and they have partially gone extinct, and we have tried to film them for a long time underwater, and we haven't been able to. So um, we just found this creek after two or three years of looking for them, and, well, here they are. So let's go in and swim with them. biotopes you can find a large amount of aquatic fauna like the amphibians which depend on the humidity and water to reproduce. Other important inhabitants of our natural aquariums are the reptiles. They occupy the top of the food chain of all these aquatic systems. Some of these reptiles are extremely dangerous, like this Micrurus naturarii, which is the most poisonous aquatic snake in Venezuela. This is probably the first underwater footage of this species in its natural habitat. It can last more than five minutes underwater
Freshwater fish can be found almost in every place where there's water. You can find them in cold water mountain creeks to hot stationary rain puddles. They have evolved for millions of years in a vast array of forms, shapes and colors. Breeding and feeding habits have specialized and diversified to fill every available aquatic niche. Here you will get to see what their natural habitat really looks like. Tannic rivers, flooded areas, and Morichalis. In the wild, from humans to plants, they all depend on our natural aquarium in many ways. Non-aquatic organisms depend on our natural aquariums for food. As the birds that feed on fish and crustaceans. They also rely on our natural aquariums as a drinking water source or simply to take a bath. There are innumerable types of continental or freshwater aquatic habitats in Venezuela, but I generalize them this way. Brackish water, lakes and dams, silty rivers, mountain rivers, <laughs> 